presentation, think of it as like your introduction to the first labor union. And I would refer you, if you want more information, to Zena Beth over here and her book, Buried in Butte. She has not only more information about the union, but especially more information about its first president, who you'll see here. But I'm not really going to talk about him because Zena Beth has done all of that research and we can only do this by having a co-author up here. So, uh, <laughs> so I refer you to Zena Beth on that and think of this as, as an overview. And I'm also going to do a couple of other things, too, to start with, because this uh, work, and this story is told at the Butte Labor History Center. First, I want to give you an overview, an update on what's going on with the Butte Labor History Center. And then at the end, I have some pictures. They're pretty cool pictures from 1881. That's not quite 1878, but it's pretty close. And I just want to show them to you if you have not seen them and explore them because they're really pretty cool, outstanding pictures of Butte and Walkerville from 1881. And that's getting back there pretty far. They are some of the uh, coolest early pictures that I know of. So to start with, in terms of the Labor History Center, um, we have been, I think, very successful for a new organization that just got started really this year. How many of you have been to the Labor History Center? Most of you, okay, great. Um, we're still working, of course. We are not done, although we do have all but one of these banner displays that we plan on uh, in place now. The most recent one that we have installed is the one about the strikes from the 1930s to the 1960s. Thanks to uh, the Courtney's over here for uh, sponsoring that one. Um, and we have one more, which will be today. And we're trying to get Montana Resources appropriately to sponsor that one. So that's the only one left in the chronological story of the labor history of Butte that we're uh, intending to have. We have a few others that are specific to some particular unions that, that uh, organizations and entities have uh, sponsored that are not done yet. So there will be more coming. And in the long run, our plan has always been to have computer-based stations with touch screens where you can touch the screen and, and have a reenactment of Frank Little's words or Jeanette Rankin's words, things like that, and much more in-depth information. We're calling them research stations or information sta stations. We're calling them that even though we don't have any yet. Um, but that is uh, the, the longer-term goal, and uh, we're optimistic that that will, that that will happen. Um, we also have this huge big panorama that most of you are probably familiar with. It, it hung on this wall right here when the archives first got it. They don't really have a good place to display it, so we have it on loan. This is uh, an image of Butte from about 1970 or 71, looking from somewhere on the East Ridge. I realize that it's a little bit... Uh, um, well, it's a huge things so you can't see too much, but there's the Berkeley Pit. Here's Uptown over here. Um, and. Uh, the Big Butte is right there with the M on it. So this is um, McQueen, still there, and Meterville, mostly gone. That Leonard Mine is right there. So uh, that's the date of this. And this is a, a pretty fantastic thing Sorry. for people to come in and, and see and reminisce about and, and talk about the things that they find there. So we're really pleased to have that on display. But again, it is from the archives on loan to us. Here's the story of what happened this year. We did get a grant from Butte Silver Boat, one of the economic mill levy grants. We were the only organization to get everything we asked for. <laughs> and I think that was because we asked for the least. We only asked for uh, $1,650, which paid for startup things, such as the $400 that it costs to apply to be a nonprofit with the IRS. It paid for the $300 that it took to design our professional logo. Um, it paid for uh, rack cars, our, our initial um, uh, promotional items. So um, besides that, we did get sponsorships adding up to a total of nearly $4,000, other donations of over $1,000, and our entry fees with 290 visitors was also over $1,000. We're really very happy with this. 290 may not sound like a lot, but just to give you a comparison, the May was regular visitation this year was 327. So we're very happy to have had 290 visitors just in our first opening year without a whole lot of promotion. So uh, that's the story of uh, where we are today. 
course, now it's, it's sort of the off season, as you all know, in Butte. Um, we are still open. We're basically open any time that Butte stuff next door is open. If someone's there, they can they can let you in. Um, otherwise, you can uh, uh, contact us, and we'll try to make uh, accommodations one way or the other. Does anyone have any questions about the Labor History Center and what we're going to do or what we have done? Where, where is it? Oh, it's on Park Street, uh, across from the Phoenix Building, basically. Mm -hmm. Do you know where the old Uptown Post Office was? Mm -hmm. That's where it is. Mm -hmm. 49 West Park Street is where it is, almost across from the bus kiosk. Yes, John. I, I, in 30 words or less, if possible, uh, what's the, what else are you going to add to the building you have now? To the building? Yeah, to the... It, well, in terms of displays, the, the main focus, I think, at this point will be a few more banners, um, more plaques, which will represent <coughs> unions and are also available as memorials to individuals, and these uh, computer-based workstations uh, where we will have information and reenactments and things like that that you can uh, push a button and, and get. Th those, are the, those are the things that have always been in the plan and that uh, once we have a little bit more money, we plan to do. Yes? The movies that you have are very good. Are you going to add more movies? Or? That's a great question. We, we would like to add more movies um, because we're being proper about copyright and so on. We're not going to show things like, say, Butte America without having presentation rights. And you can't just play that and show it. So we're working on things like that. We did acquire um, the film An Injury to One with presentation rights, uh, which is the story of Frank Little's murder. It's, if you've seen it, it's a pretty dark film, but it's also pretty accurate, too. So the answer is yes. We also have um, um, uh, essentially uh, uh, programs that Cheryl Ackerman here has created from films that you have here in the archives, films uh, from the 1930s of just sort of butte stories. There's a parade and, and other kind of random uh, home movie type things, too. But, uh, but they're all part of the Butte story, and, and they're pretty fun, too. So the answer to your question is yes. Kathy? Um, do you have memberships? We, we don't exactly, we don't have memberships. Um, we've sort of been entertaining the notion of how to handle this. So far, all of our revenue has really come from sponsorships, where you give us money and you can either sponsor a, a, an entire banner uh, at $250, or uh, a plaque for a union, $75, or something in honor of an individual, your grandfather or yourself, whoever, for either $25 or $50. Um, but the concept of memberships, to me, is a reasonable one that we're probably going to go to. Uh, our board really hasn't talked about that in detail yet, but ultimately I think we will. Anything else? Okay, great. Then I will launch into uh, my fairly brief story of uh, oh, there we go of uh, the uh, union that began here in Butte in 1878. I want to set the scene by describing what was going on in 1878 in the United States and in Europe. The main thing that was going on in 1878 was a depression an economic depression that had started back in 1873. It's referred to as the Panic of 1873, a financial panic. And the big deal from Butte's point of view and the West's point of view is that like in 1893, 20 years later, it really impacted the price of silver. The price of silver was um, uh, pushed down because of the different financial things that were going on, including uh, uh, speculative investment, which demonetizes all kinds of uh, uh, currency. Inflation, after the US Civil War and in Europe, the Franco-Prussian War, which was in the very early 1870s, these fire losses are specifically in some of the big financial centers. The Great Chicago Fire was in 1871, and there was a huge big fire in Boston in 1872 or 1873, I can't quite remember. Um, and banks in general were having big problems. So all of that led to depressed silver prices, and this continued through the 1870s. So in 1878, there was really a big financial problem across the entire United States that was affecting mining. This is one of the reasons why Butte's low point in population is 1874. Gold had been discovered and was still out there in Silver Boat Creek. But by 1874, our population, depending on who you want to read, was down to either 61 or 241, some very small number. 
um, and they were, most of them, Chinese, just going through the diggings, trying to find what they could. Butte was really, truly on its way to becoming a ghost town in the middle 1870s, and this financial crisis was the, the primary uh, force behind that, that and the fact that, yeah, the gold was running out, at least the easy-to-find gold. Uh, in 1875 is the year that the prospectors came back to Butte and they did find silver and the underground mining began. Well, I just said that silver prices were depressed, but all of the volume of silver that was found both in Butte and in Phillipsburg and was sort of uh, still being found in Nevada at the Comstock Road, those are the three primary places with silver that really kept the silver market going. And those three places were the primary silver sources in the United States in the 1870s, Butte, Phillipsburg, and the remnants of the Comstock Road in Nevada. So even though there was a financial depression and it was affecting the price of silver, the fact that we did have silver was still a good thing. It's not like silver became worthless. <laughs> and the fact that we had a lot of silver was the big plus for Butte, and that's what started Butte, even in the middle of a depression, back on the upward trend, starting in 1875, when the asteroid, which is now the Trevona mine, was established. So all of that was going on, and, and here, as I say there, it moderated the effects of that depression. So Butte was really starting to boom again in 1875. That's the year that the first building that was a two-story building was erected. Anyone know what it was? Hotel the Hotel de Mineral, yes. It stood at the corner of Broadway and Main Street, the southwest corner of Broadway and Main. The first two-story building was built in 1875. So now we're going to be three years later than 1875. And uh, so let's talk about Butte and Montana. 39,000 people lived in all of Montana in 1880. So take some of the numbers, take these numbers down some for two years earlier. The population of Butte in 1878, by the census, was not quite 3,400 people. And Walkerville, a separate town, had over 400. Walkerville, well, Walkerville does remain a separate town to this day, as you know. And mm -hmm. Walkerville's special. I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll always keep track of Walkerville separately. But Walkerville's important to this story. We'll get to it in just a second. So nowhere in Montana were there any railroads, electricity, or telephones. Nowhere. Not in Butte. Silver was the king, even again in the midst of this economic and financial depression. So here's why Walkerville was important in 1870s. Because Butte's mineral district is zoned. It's like a, an onion that's been sliced off. And the outer rim, the outer part of it here, is where most of the silver is, or more of the silver at least. So the Alice Mine in Walkerville, the Orphan Girl out west, and the Travona down south, this is much more silver rich than the core of Butte, which was much more copper rich. And in 1875, really seriously, hardly anybody cared about copper. You really didn't do much with copper. So silver was truly, <coughs> truly king. And even though we always say, I at least always say, that copper started to, to come to the fore as soon as the electric light was invented in 1879 and the telephone in 1876, and the Butte was at the right place at the right time to take advantage of the copper needs for those wonderful new inventions, in reality, silver really remained the most important commodity in Butte right through the 1880s and really until 1893 when the financial panic and the depression in the price of silver really, well, for example, shut Phillipsburg off pretty much and impacted the silver production in Butte a lot. And then copper truly did become king, but not until the 1890s. So uh, in the 1880s, yeah, copper was being produced and copper was valuable and they paid attention, but silver really was the important commodity through the 1880s. So it's because of this, uh, this zonation. And if it's an onion, you might want to say, well, where's all the silver over there in the continental pit of Montana Resources? Well, it's because of this fault zone. The continental pit exposes rocks that have been lifted 4,000 feet above where they used to be. So the silver zone is eroded away. Hmm. So they're only getting a tiny amount of silver over there in the, in the present pit. And they're producing molybdenum as their byproduct because it's lifted up to the surface. Over here, the molybdenum is 4,000 feet down. So uh, it was less, uh, less obtainable and less uh, um, profitable to produce it over here. And where does MN 
And man is manganese. Thank you. Manganese um, is, if you go out walking to the west, out below the mining museum on those trails, all those rocks that you see out there that are black, that's not soot. Most of that is manganese oxide that's been deposited from the water in the mines on the rocks. And, uh, and Butte is actually, I think, number three in the United States as a manganese producer, too. Huh. And what do they use manganese for? Manganese today is largely a, a steel alloy, just like molybdenum is. Um, but you use manganese in, in standard batteries as well. It's the, it's the electrolyte, it's the pasty stuff that's inside of a, of a regular, not a modern battery like a lithium battery, but a regular old flashlight battery. The paste that's in there has manganese in it to conduct the, the, the ions, which is what generates the electricity in a, in a battery, a dry cell battery. So there's a fair volume of manganese in that too. Anything else? Those are good questions. Okay, so here we are back in Butte now in 1878. So despite this national depression that was going on, Butte really truly did begin to take off in 1875 with the Hotel de Mineral. In 1878, 15 new brick business blocks were erected. And I would love to tell you which ones they were, but I don't know. <laughs> I tried to figure it out, but this is the, this is the line that I got from, uh, from some publication of uh, Butte in 1878. The 15 brick buildings here in the uptown somewhere, that's not trivial. I would presume and expect that most of them were one-story buildings. Uh, there might have been a two-story building that was erected, um, but not very many. Uh, and there probably was one in Walkerville, and we'll get to that toward the end of the talk. Um, the Walker brothers, they were the owners of the Alice Mine up in Walkerville, hence the name Walkerville. The silver production was up there. In 1878, they were producing $45,000 a month in silver and whatever else they got. But think of that as almost all silver. A third of that was going to their payroll, which employed 80 men. And they were producing about 7,000 tons of ore at those prices that you see there, averaging maybe $50 or $100 in silver per ton of, uh, uh, of ore. The Lexington, also up toward the north, was owned by A.J. Davis, the, the founder and, and president of the First National Bank here in Butte, and often referred to as Montana's first millionaire. Well, he, he wasn't just a banker. He did start as a mine owner. I don't know for sure that he was truly a miner. He may well have been in his earlier years, but he was fundamentally a mine investor and a mine owner, and Zena Beth is saying he was not a miner. So I trust you on that. Well, and he was also, that million dollar thing is partially myth because he was extremely wealthy when he came to the state. Okay, so he came here, he didn't necessarily yeah, make all that money. Yeah, he came here with a lot of money. Cool. Okay, well the, the Lexington had six, six shafts in its, uh, in its <laughs> complex there. 150 feet doesn't sound very deep today, but that was fairly deep in those days. And uh, they had built the, the Lexington Mill, which was just down here on Park Street is where it was located. Um, and it paid for itself within a year. And they had one streak of ore that had $20,000 a ton in silver. Mm. And as you see, $18,000 a ton in gold. I'm sure that that was not very extensive, but nonetheless, there it was and had been analyzed and assayed at that kind of a value. This is not trivial, Doc. Is that uh, 1878 dollars you're talking? Mm -hmm. you're not talking about? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm going to say I'm 90 percent sure that it was. I, I think where I got that was from an, an old publication, so it would have been in dollars of the day. They would not have adjusted it because they didn't do that back then. Yeah, John. Where did most of the silver after it was mined and out of the mine, sitting on a counter? Where did it go? Uh, away. <laughs> <laughs> As everything has gone away from Butte, um, and, and the money went away. In Phillipsburg, I can tell you that the, uh, the, the Eads family, which is from St. Louis, were some of the primary investors in um, uh, Phillipsburg. And the Eads Bridge, which crosses the Mississippi River, it was one of the first bridges across the Mississippi at St. Louis, was fundamentally paid for by Phillipsburg silver. The, the, the silver in Butte, was certainly going into the pockets of these local guys, Lex uh, Davis, but the Alice production was going to Salt Lake City. That's where the uh, Walker brothers were. 
And uh, uh, as you know very well, the further along we get, the more corporate things got, and the more headquarters moved toward, well, New York City. Uh, so ultimately, that's where the money flowed. Or to San Francisco, in the case of the Hearsts that were supporting Daly and so on. So fundamentally, it was going to the places where you could spend it. You know, you couldn't spend a million dollars in Butte short of building your house. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, that's as much as I can say in terms of answer there, but it went away pretty much. Okay, um, and then Clark was also involved, no surprise here, and Clark's original made $30,000 in profit in 1878, and uh, he was producing close to 100 ounces per ton of copper in that, or sorry, of silver in that year, and his ore was rated around 15% copper. 15%. For comparison, here's what Montana Resources produces today. They get, on average, seven one-hundredths of an ounce of silver per ton. And their copper, their good copper ore, is three, uh, three, this isn't right, this should be three-tenths of a percent, not three-hundredths of a percent, but three-tenths of a percent copper. That's six pounds of copper per ton. So Clark had 500 times as much copper in his ore as Montana Resources has today. Wow. So it was rich. <laughs> the most famous and, and most uh, telling story that I've ever read, in, in the very early 1880s when copper production was really starting to chug along, they, and before there were significant smelters here in Butte, they reportedly could put the ore, the copper ore, on wagons here in Butte, haul it up to Fort Bend on the Missouri River, How, that's a four hour drive today, right? Haul it up there, put it on barges down the Missouri and the Mississippi River to New Orleans, put it on a boat, take it across the Atlantic Ocean to the smelters at Swansea, Wales, and it was still economic. <laughs> well, you don't have to be very smart to figure out that, hey, we can smelt it over here and save all that transportation cost. Even if it was economic, we're going to make more if we do it here. And so that's when the smelting started here in an aggressive way. 1883 is when Anaconda was built, basically, by, by Daly. So all of that was happening um, in, that, uh, in that same time frame. It had to be an amazing place here in Butte in this 1878 to early 1880s time uh, when the population was just exploding and all manner of things were happening. So, okay. Here's the total production just from this one year here in Butte. Almost $900,000 in silver bullion. That's bullion that was turned into silver ingots. That's not the ore. They produced about 85000 in gold. That's down from what they were producing in the best gold years of the Placer mines in the 1860s. This much ore was shipped, so it totals more than a million dollars. This is a million dollars, and this definitely is in 1878 dollars. I have no idea what the buying power of that would be today, but it's got to be many tens of millions of dollars in terms of today's dollars. The average production cost was $12 a ton. The average value was $40 to $200 a ton. You can see the profit margin. And the miner's wage was $3.50 a day. Okay. This now sets the scene for the summer of 1878 and what was going on there. It started um, in early June of 1878, and the two big silver mines, the Lexington and the Alice, Davis and the Walker brothers, in the person of Marcus Daly, who was their manager, decided to cut the wage from $3.50 a day to $3 a day. Well, of course, that didn't sit well when they knew all this production was happening. This was going on. So uh, clearly, even though the depression was theoretically in place, it really probably was pretty minimal here in Butte. I doubt very much if that nationwide depression really was even noticeable here in Butte because you saw those figures. You saw how much money was floating around here uh, in Butte. So when they decided to cut the wage, the miners decided this is not a good idea. We don't like this. Of course they decided that. And so uh, June 13th is the date of the uh, formation of the committee that ultimately created the Constitution and so on of the Butte Working Men's Union. And the newspaper article here, which is from the Helena Independent, discusses this, but I've said pretty much 
of everything they have to say here. But let's just read the, the quote they have from the miner. Yesterday, in consequence of a general reduction of the wages heretofore paid in the Alice and Lexington, the employees in those mines struck and knocked off work. In the afternoon, they marched down from Walkerville and passed through our principal streets, an orderly procession of about 400 men headed by a brass band. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad for a, for a spur of the moment organized uh, parade. And as our forms are closed, that means they'd already going to press, uh, they were holding the meeting in the Orpheum Hall, and we will defer all comment on the proceedings until next week. That's what the minor reported. Zena Beth, do you know where the Orpheum Hall was? Do you know either? I don't either. I have tried really hard to figure this out, and I don't know where the Orpheum Hall was. But um, clearly it was a meeting hall that was available for them to uh, have at least 400 men um, jammed in there. I imagine it was a pretty small building. So um, this is what was happening on June 13th. By the end of June, the uh, uh, union that had been organized, the Butte Working Men's Union, had over 300 members, and Aaron Witter, Witter here was chosen as its first president. And again, I'm going to refer you to Zenabeth and her book, Buried in Butte. She's got pages in there about Aaron Witter and his role in this. But I'll tell you this much, on June 13th, 1878, it was his birthday. It was his 28th birthday, and uh, I can just kind of imagine that he must have been pretty proud of that for a birthday present. Based on his future role with the union and so on, um, he clearly was an activist and he cared about things here in the union. Well, this strike goes on for a while, and uh, this is from later in June, and there had been no outbreaks and none were anticipated. That means violence of any kind of sort. It may be possible that a few bummers uh, with which every camp is afflicted, may seize upon the present time to play communists. Uh, but if they do, the miners' union, assisted by the good people of Butte, will make short work of them. There must be no violence. At least this was how the newspaper reported it. The shutting down of the mines will be seriously felt, but the strike will result in good. This is interesting from the Butte miners. Uh, it's interesting from any newspaper in Butte, even though at the time, the influence of the mine owners, in fact, I'm not sure, do you, do you guys know when Clark bought the miner? Anybody know? It, he may not have even owned it in 1878. Um, if he didn't, he owned it in short order thereafter. So uh, uh, the, the strike is ongoing into the summer of 1878. Dull times is what resulted. <laughs> dull times. It has brought very dull times. We were assured that one of our leading merchants, that his sales have fallen off 25% since the beginning of the strike. Well, why is this? Well, the guys aren't getting paid. <laughs> the people who would be spending money don't have the money to spend. Um, and uh, uh, the credit demands have increased. They will be worrying about what's going to go on. Well, this is June 25th. It's going to go on for almost another two months. Now we're up to July 9th, and the report of the Butte Miner at that point um, is that uh, they're, they're really still discussing things, and they're, and they're basically fighting and demanding and so on. And uh, the Stokes still continue unworked with no prospects of an immediate settlement of the wage difficulty. So we're now not quite one month into it. Now we're almost two months into it, and we're still discussing things. They have gone up to Mr. Davis's mill to uh, uh, insist that the men who were still working, and there were some, uh, should knock off work and uh, participate in the demand. There are various reports about whether or not there were threats on A.J. Davis's life at this point in time. Um, generally speaking, it sounds like there were not, but the possibility may exist that there were some threats. It isn't clear. Uh, and uh, it's also reported in the paper that the merchants and so on of town really did support the, the striking miners. That's not perfectly clear either in terms of a, a general presumption. So I would imagine that in a city of 4,000, a booming city of 4,000, you're going to be all over the map. That's really what you should expect. All kinds of diversity. I'm sure there's a businessman over here who really does support the miners. And then this businessman over here probably doesn't really support the miners. He's more friends with A.J. Davis or whatever. So I don't think you can color everything with one brush. You never could do that in view. 
So, so it's always been diverse and complicated, and, and we don't really have, I at least do not have enough information to really say very much definitively about the way things were in Butte during this strike. All we can go by are these few newspaper articles that we have available. Okay, so this did continue with peaceful protests and so on, and uh, finally did end in the middle of August in 1878, and the wage was reinstated. So they won. They did win, and the Butte Working Men's Union was pretty well established. Just in a few years, 1881, it was reorganized as the Butte Miners Union. So that is the, the, the parent, if we want to call it that, of the Butte Miners Union. And then starting in 1881, there were other unions that were formed. And this has some far-reaching effects. It basically divided the industrial unions, the, the miners' unions, from what were, came to be called the craft unions carpenters, electricians, the specialty type unions. And down the road, that has a big effect within the, the, the overall union and the way the unions work together. They ultimately came to have a parting of the ways, and the AFL-CIO, we're way down the road now into the 1930s, the AFL-CIO actually split over this issue of whether or not the craft unions really had the same power and the same kind of rights as the industrial unions. There were probably many more numbers in the industrial unions than there were in the craft unions, but there were more unions within the craft unions than there were industrial unions. So when you're talking about an umbrella organization like the AFL-CIO, how does that work? Well, it's complicated, and I'm not going to get into that because that takes us way beyond 1878. But uh, uh, the, the story of this is, is very complicated and, and, and far-reaching. It was, I believe, not until the early 1950s that the AFL and the CIO reunited. Uh, so they had about a 20-year period there where they did not really work together very well. They weren't a union. And the whole point of a union is solidarity. So when your union splits, you've got a problem. Uh, the Butte Working Men's Union was reestablished 10 years later, and it was part of, it was sort of a, an umbrella organization within an umbrella organization. The Silver Bow Trades and Labor Assembly was kind of the, the great grandfather umbrella of everybody in Butte. But the Butte Working Men's Union was a, a sort of a sub-umbrella within that, and it continued for quite a long while, decades, uh, providing sort of general support, especially for some of the craft unions that really didn't have a lot of money because they didn't have a lot of members. So the Butte Working Men's Union continued for some time as sort of this small umbrella uh, organization. Uh, but it was no longer the, the thing that it was to start with, which fundamentally was the Butte Miners Union. That's what it was when it started, and it became the Butte Miners Union within about three or four years. And uh, I just, I put this here because I happened to find it. I was looking for something else doing some labor history research here in the archives, and this is a, a pin. Miners Union Day for 1900, for June 13th, 1900. This pin is in one of the files in, in one of their boxes over there in the, over here in, uh, in the vault. And just finding a little artifact like that where you expect to find nothing but papers is, is always one of the fun things about exploring this stuff here in the archives. Do you have any questions at this point? Okay. What I want to do now is talk about these two photographs. Um, these uh, came about on Facebook. Uh, if you don't like Facebook, this is one reason to like Facebook. And if you have followed me and some other people on Facebook, you're going to be familiar with these things. There is uh, a, a person who goes by building in the past. And he uh, uh, posts historic buildings, is what he does, from all over, mostly the West, is what he does. He'll just get pictures and he, and he shares them. This is a nice thing. Well, he shared this picture. and. I had never seen this picture, and I don't claim to have seen every picture that there is of Butte, but I've seen most of them, and especially in these early years. I know everything that the archives has and the mining museum has from the, the very early years, the 1870s, 1880s, and they do not have this. Well, it turns out it was taken by a man named Charles Roscoe Savage, and this was digitized by the Brigham Young University Library. 
because this guy actually worked for the Mormon church. He was born in England, became a Mormon in England, and then uh, immigrated to the US and ended up setting up his office in, uh, in Salt Lake City. He's probably most famous as the photographer who took the picture of the golden spike that united the two railroads at Promontory Point in Utah. Well, he also took this picture. Well, the big deal on this picture, several big deals. I mean, to me, seeing a picture like this, a pretty spectacular picture of Butte, the first thing I want to know is, well, where is it? When is it? And we had an extremely interesting online discussion amongst quite a large number of people um, talking about where things are. Well, if you're familiar with historic view, you probably recognize this church. Anyone recognize it? It does not exist today, but there is a church there. What's that? Sacred Heart. No, it's not Sacred Heart. Is it the Scandinavian church? It's not the Scandinavian church. The other one? No, it's not the other one either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not in Walkerville. it's not in Walkerville. Who said Mountain View? It's Mountain View. Oh, okay. This First is the Mountain, Mountain View church that preceded the present one. The present one was built in 1899. So instantly we know that this is pre-1899. There's Timber Butte right there, the highlands back there, and this is Idaho Street. Oh. The photographer is standing essentially in front of that, that yellow house with the turret that's yeah. at the head of Idaho Street, mm -hmm. essentially at um, uh, Copper and Idaho is where the photographer is standing, looking right down Idaho Street. So what's not there, John? <laughs> the mansion. Yeah, because house is not McDonald's there. house is across the street. I've, I've seen this picture before, but I couldn't remember where the hell I saw it. <laughs> um, the, the, and if I can, this house right right here, I think it is. This is, this is that white house on the corner of Idaho and Granite. And no. when Clark bought these there's a picture Dick, of this lot, not these three houses, but... Actually, John, here. You're, you're a block off because this is Broadway Street right here. This is Granite Street right here, and this is Court Street right here. So <coughs> your house is right here. This is Mountain View Church. These are the places yeah. that are the parking lot. Your house is right here because that right there, yeah. that's the Presbyterian Church. Oh. On the so side of the Presbyterian Church. On the corner of Broadway and Idaho. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, come back. But it's here. the one preceding the one that's there now. Yeah. On what street? Idaho and Broadway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Corner of Idaho and Broadway. And then this is Granite right that's here. Granite. And then this is Quartz right there. And this is where Cindy Shaw's house is? Cindy Shaw's house would be... Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, John. This is Cindy Shaw's house is what I'm pointing to. You're one block down at, yeah. at Granite. Yeah. You're, you're right there. So, so with all that now, because we know the job. I had to get close built. enough, my eyes don't work. When was, John, when, was, when was your house built, John? When was it started? Started in 1884. Okay, so now years. we are before 1884, and we are after 1876, because that's when this church was built. So we've narrowed it down to within a decade. Can we figure it out even more accurately when it is? Well, we think we can. Um, for one thing, the uh, Charles Savage. If he came to Butte, if he came, he was he did a lot of photography with the railroads. Okay, well, if he came to Butte on the railroad, who knows when he would have had to come from Salt Lake City? 1883 is when the uh, first railroad made its way from Salt Lake City to Butte. If he came on the railroad, well, he didn't have to come on the railroad, obviously. All right, let's zoom in a little bit. To let me show you where we're going to go. We're going to go to that building right there. This area is what we're going to look at. And so here's Idaho Street, Broadway Street, and here's this really big building going up. If you look at it carefully, you can tell that the top of it is not completed. Well, where it is, is the corner of Montana and Park Street. It's where Books and Books is today. It's the Caplice Block. It was the biggest building in Butte when it was built. Well, now we have a, a point that we can try to figure out. When was the Caplice block completed? Well, I didn't know. Does anybody know? It was completed in 1882. That fits with what we already know about the other things in the picture. 
Um, and it doesn't look like that on the top, though. It had a, a French Empire style on the top, like the top of the Finland Hotel today. So the top isn't finished. So I'm looking around, trying to find out when was it built, when was it finished. And I find a newspaper article from May of 1882. Like, police block is complete, yada yada. We're all happy about this. So I'm thinking, now I'm thinking that this picture was taken probably in the spring of 1882. If the complete block was finished in May, let's go back to the original one. It's hard for you to see in this, in this version here, but when you look at it, sorry, that's the wrong one. That's the one that screws on. When you look at the shadows here, it's clear that the sun is in the west, right? The shadows of these buildings are all pointing off that way. The sun is lighting the west sides of the buildings. So the sun's in the west. Well, most of these shadows are running just almost exactly east-west. They are parallel to the streets. When does that happen? There's only two times when that happens. It happens at the equinoxes. So it happens in March, and it happens in September. So I'm thinking, because the Caprice block is finished in May, that this was probably taken in March of 1881. Well. There we sat for a little while, but Larry Hoffman comes along and looking at it, and you cannot see it in here at all, but uh, the, the mountains that are back there, they're better in the original. There's no snow on the mountains, and there's clearly no snow down here. Now, it's not impossible to have no snow on the ground in view in the middle of March. But it's kind of unlikely, as you all know. Um, and no snow on Timber Butte, no snow in the area whatsoever. So he made the case that it should be September of 1881 instead of March of 1882 because of the lack of snow. Well, I'm still stuck on the complete block back there. Uh, not finished, uh, but close to finished because it's it, this is how tall it got. Three stories, but the top isn't done yet. Okay, well, I'll look around some more. This is how you research things. And lo and behold, guess what? In November of 1881, the complete block was not finished, but it was finished enough that they were using it. They were having parties there in the big room. Uh, other things were happening there. So, the, in fact, the newspaper article, which was from, uh, I think it's early October, says, the, the walls of the Caprice block are looking very good now, rising, looming up above the city or something like that, which makes it sound like they're pretty tall, as you see them there. So combining all that, the conclusion for all of this was that this photo was probably taken in mid to late September of 1881. And so that's the story we're sticking with. If you want to argue about it, we can argue about it. But we had a lot of fun trying to figure that out. This is, this is one of my favorite things to do, is, is get some old picture. Where is that first? When is that second? Um, and you know, you use all these different kinds of clues, and it's really a lot of fun. And the only building in the photo, I believe, that is still standing today is the Jacobs House. And that's it right there. The Jacobs House was supposed to be built in 1879, the year Henry Jacobs was elected our first mayor. And uh, that's the position that it should be in. And when you zoom in on that and look at the roof lines, it's exactly the roof line of the Jacobs House as it sits today. So I'm pretty certain that that's the Jacobs House. Um, and John's house is not present, nor is the Leonard Hotel. Certainly not, because it was built in 1906. So I believe that the only building in this entire photo that still stands is the Jacobs House. Mm -hmm. Yes? Way off to the left, up, 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 towards the top, are those two stacks? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you talking about this thing? Yeah, and, and actually down in this lower picture here, down. where you showed the Jacobs House, you can see the two dashes. Yeah. Okay, follow the, ste the steeple on the church. And go, go towards the highland. Oh, right, oh, right, right there. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we'd spent a long time trying to figure this one out. Mm -hmm. We didn't really work too much on those, but the, the Colorado smelter has got to be out there. Okay. Uh, it existed, and that's probably what's making all that smoke that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular one here, I don't think we ever really got it figured out. It's okay. It's got to be somewhere about, because this is Montana Street right here, it's mm -hmm. got to be about Mercury between Montana and Maine. Maine Street is, is all the way over here. So Mercury or Galena or Silver. So it might be about where the Emma Mine is, but it's not the Emma Mine because it came later, I think. 
Um, but there are other mines, even on the 1884 Sanborn map. We did. We we tried. I don't. I don't feel comfortable about saying what that one was. These ones here. I don't know what that would be either, because the Colorado smelter is over there, mm -hmm. and the other ones would be around the corner over in Meterville. <coughs> so what those are, I don't know. Okay. Anyway, all the information in this photo is just boggling to me. I, I, it's my favorite picture that I've ever seen of you, probably. Thank you. And here it is with the streets superimposed on it. I've already told you what things were. There's, there's Idaho Street. Here's Quartz right here. There's Montana Street. Check it along there. There's the Jacobs House. Here is Main Street, I think. It's possible that it's Utah Street. There's that stack we're talking about. So there's Montana Park. It's, it's foreshortened very much, which makes it confusing. But uh, I, I'm really quite sure, and, and everybody who was involved in the discussion, I think, agrees at this point what these streets are. The, the, the points of contact and where you can figure things out are really pretty good. So I'm, I'm very confident that this is about what it, it is. So he took one other picture. He probably took a lot more pictures. It's almost inconceivable that a photographer like Charles Savage would come to Butte and only take two pictures. These are the only two, at least, that Brigham Young University has digitized. And there was a fire in Charles Savage's studio in the early 1880s. Mm. And I think it's a reasonable pre presumption that many of his photographs were destroyed. So maybe this is why there's only two, at least only two that we know of. But here's the second one. This is Walkerville. Yeah. And this ties to the whole story here because there's the Alice. That's the Alice and the Molten. And mm. this is 18, we're assuming that this is the same time as the other one. So uh, the fall of 1881. And um, uh, it's another spectacular image that shows incredible detail. Now, this is Daly Street. And if you compare this photo, this is 1881, if you compare this photo to the 1884 Sanborn map, you can identify most of these buildings on here. And you can't read it because of this photo, but in the original, what that says on that sign right there, it says Rainbow Saloon. Hmm. And this one says, I think it says Meat Market or something like Mastis. that. Mastis Meat What does it say? Mastis Meat Market. Okay. So um, you can figure these things out. And again, to me, this is very fun. There's one building in this photo that still stands. Does anyone recognize it? The liquor store. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite the liquor store. But this is, this is Main Street, and this is Daly right here. Is it yeah, the church? church. You're calling it a church? That building right there was not built as a church. It was built by Caplice, the same guy who was building the other place mm. down in Butte. Caplice and McCune, this was the general store for Walkerville. And it's still there. And all I think anybody ever knew for sure was that that building is pre-1884 because it's on the 1884 Sanborn map. Well, now we can say it's pre-fall of 1881 because it's in this part. And I'm pretty sure that's the only one that survives out of all these buildings. Um, the Alice here has an old stamp mill right there. It has this tramway that took the ore to this place, which was referred to as the new stamp mill. It had been built within a couple of years of 1881. The old one dates back to about 1875 or 76. So that just shows you how much production was, was burgeoning and, and exploding uh, in, at the Alice in this time of the 1870s. And this is the molten over here, also a silver mine. And most all of these structures actually show up on the 1884 map. So it's really very similar to the 1884 map, too. Yes? On, on that map, on the very extreme right, uh, would one of those be a school? Because there was a Jefferson School up there. Yeah, the Jefferson School, I think the Jefferson School would be, be just a off a little bit, like about another block, okay. um, but not very far. Yeah, the Jefferson School he's talking about actually, I think, was the first school in Walkerville. Um, and it gets confusing because people also know about the Jefferson School in Butte, but there was a Jefferson School in Walkerville. And the Sherman School uh, is not here. How about the Jackson? The, what? the Jackson. The Jackson? Glenn Waters remembered the Jackson School. Um, do you know where it was? I think it was on North Main Street. Well, 
This is North Main Street right here. You told me that it pre it, the Jackson was older than the Sherman. There were several wood buildings that were replaced in that 1897-98 era. Yeah. The Blaine replaced the Adams. Yeah. He said the Sherman replaced the Jackson, and he remembered the Jackson. Okay. Um, I don't see anything that really looks like a school in there, but that doesn't mean anything because it they only had to serve a, a small number of people, so it would have been pretty small. And if I remember right, which I may well not, the, the 1884 map only shows the Jefferson School on it. But don't quote me on that for sure at all, because I don't really know. I, I, think, I think the Sherman was built in 97, 98, and I, there, I think, so I think the Jackson was probably there in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, I, Without knowing about the Jackson, I agree with you on the Sherman School. That's just the style of it, it's late 1890s. So, that's it. Thank you. Yes. in this model, although I would be willing to bet that these cabins in through here, these are residences. And uh, if you look at the 1884 maps, so just three years after this photo, there's a lot over there uh, to the Any east of Main Street. Walkerville, were they living up there? Um, who knows? Uh, you know, you can't see what's on the other side up there on seldom seen. On the floor, like directly in, right of the mill up there? Um, in here? Yeah, that's where we live. Um, yeah, I'm sure there were eventually. Uh, whether there were in 1881 to 1884, this is harder to say. I mean, this is this is the photo. So what you see, you can interpret things as well as I can. But I would also be willing to bet that in many cases, these businesses, the proprietors lived in the back because mm -hmm. um, they often did, even quite a bit later. But I bet these are homes down here. That those are homes there, and I know there's more stuff over there, at least in 1884. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.